Educación personalizada. Formación humanística. Campus ecológico. Clubes deportivos. Calidad académica. la mitad del mundo, bienvenidos a la Universidad de Hemisferios. Se parte de algo más grande. Welcome everybody. Uh, we are very glad to have here Pablo Rizanenko. He's a former congressman uh, from Ukraine and he um, acceded to try to explain us in a very short time what this problem with between Ukraine and Russia is about. Uh, we also have here Mario Dos Santos, that is one of our best students from the faculty. Uh, and Pablo, I understand right now, for example, you were in a call, uh, helping people in the phone line in the middle of the war. So it's really fabulous that you are helping us understand this conflict. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh... Hi everyone. So let uh, Carlos, we are, we were classmates at Harvard course and uh, Carlos asked me to, invited me to help to understand uh, the war in Ukraine, actually the war between Russia and Ukraine. So I volunteered to do that because I think it's not a matter of Ukraine and Russia, it's a matter for the whole world, yeah however scary it might be yeah it's not just some small conflict or whatever so you probably know from the news that uh, on 24th of february russia attacked ukraine with military force and uh, the war started it's interesting that in russia they don't use the war world the world war they say it's a special operation But, you know, it's, a, it's some kind of narrative for domestic consumption because uh, everyone knows in Ukraine and in the world that it's a real war. It's not like some kind of border conflict. Uh, Russia has amassed about 185,000 troops on the borders of Ukraine and thousands and thousands of military equipment pieces like uh, tanks, uh, airplanes, helicopters, rocket launchers, and so on. So on 24th, they attacked by rockets, not, not just one place, but the whole country, all military infrastructure and the critical infrastructure, airports, air defense, military units, uh, all military units. They bombarded them for two days, and after that, they... They, they basically, their troops crossed uh, the borders from three sides, from south, uh, east, and north, actually from Belarus. Belarus is also a former Soviet Union Republic, formerly indep an independent country, but actually uh, the regime there is controlled by Russia. So their troops crossed the border even from Belarus, uh, from the north. So the objective of Russians or I would say, I don't like to use the word Russians. Uh, the objective of Putin's regime is to, basically at the root of the conflict is the willingness of Ukraine to be part of the free world. Uh, if you compare Russia and Ukraine, these are like Russia is 150 million people, Ukraine is 44 million people. Uh, both were former Soviet Union republics when Soviet Union uh, fell apart in 1991, all countries became independent. But Russia basically is, is inherited the empire. I mean, not inherited the empire, but it always used to be an empire. Uh, monarchist empire before 1917, then Soviet empire, and though Soviet Union was called like the Union of uh, Free Socialist Republics, but Everyone understood that in terms of population, everything, and the decision-making, it was like Russia and the 
former former republics which uh, just don't have any rights. But after the breakup of the Soviet Union, like it was like Fukuyama wrote, the end of history, liberal democratic uh, world and uh, ideology has won the competition with the communism and now everyone would be happy. Uh, and Ukraine followed the course, like it's representative democracy, we have free elections, we transformed the economy into market economy and so on. But Russia went a little bit different course. Uh, the first 10 years, they were also trying to rebuild into democracy, to transform themselves into democracy. But since 2000, uh, when Putin was elected, they started to, uh, you know, it turned from democracy to autocracy. And now, I would call it totally despotic state. They don't have any free elections. Putin is in power for 20 years. There is no opposition. All opposition is jailed, repressed, or even murdered. Uh, he consolidated power to such a great extent. And uh, he has two ideas. One is open and one is hidden. The open idea is he dreams about recreating uh, that Russian Empire that existed before 1917, which included many countries, even the ones that you don't think they belong to that empire, like Finland, Poland, and uh, many more. And definitely former Soviet Union republics like Ukraine, Belarus, Baltic states, uh, Georgia, Armenia, Kazakhstan, there are like 14, 14 countries. So he publicly, he, he brags about uh, that breakup of the Soviet Union was the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of 20th century. But for all nations that gain independence, it's not a tragedy. It's a celebration of freedom. Because rather than being part of despotic colony without any freedom and democracy, no economic freedom, no political, no civil freedom, the countries gained independence and decided to develop on their own course. So he, 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 he claims, he thinks that he has a role in history, recreating Great Russia by returning those former Soviet republics into his sphere of orbit or taking over them. And uh, if with Belarus it worked in some kind of non-military way, the the president of Belarus, which is not who, who is not freely elected, he is in power for twenty five or twenty seven years now. Uh, there are no free elections, which uh, are recognized by international community. He became so dependent on Putin on various aspects that he he has no choice. He just does what Putin tells him. But Ukraine went, as I mentioned, went its own course. And even when Russia tried to prevent that course into joining European Union, into becoming a truly independent and free nation, uh, Russia meddled several times. In 2004, uh, they supported autocratic candidate and tried to rig the elections, but only popular protest stopped that. And then in 2014, Russia supported the same uh, autocratic uh, th then president, which was elected actually in free election. But then he tried to reverse the course of the country instead of joining EU to, to, rever uh, to, to go and join Russia in the future, which was very unpopular, like 70% of people didn't support that. So th there were peaceful protests. And when police started, there were peaceful protests for three months. But after police started to apply violence, not just violence, but shooting at people and killing people, it all became very uh, violent on all sides, though, and about 100 people of protesters were shot in the streets. Uh, and uh, as a result of that protest, uh, then president fled to Russia, that's Yanukovych. And at that moment in 2014, uh, and the new government was... Uh, was in the place. So at that point, Russia invaded, that was the first invasion in 2014. Uh, but 
as we, but as Russia says, it was uh, peaceful, not invasion, but liberation of some regions of Ukraine. Uh, Russia invaded Crimea and annexed it uh, at, uh, in 2014. And then it tried to annex in the same way some eastern regions, Donetsk and Lugansk regions. Uh, but that was, they, 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 Ukrainians started to defend that. They, and there was a so we call limited war, small war. So sm- parts of those two regions were occupied uh, by Russians, though publicly they don't admit it. I mean, everyone knows it's them. They support, they, they support separatists with arms, financial resources, even with military power when necessary. They supported them in 2014. But then that, that war stopped and well, it was frozen and it was frozen for uh, six years, till 2022. Yeah, uh, But eventually what we see that Russia never gave up on the plans to prevent Ukraine to go on its own course to join EU and uh, basically just prepared for full-scale invasion uh, so that to make it not possible in the future, yeah, uh, this to break the Ukrainian choice. So that was prelude to this full-scale war. And you need to understand that Ukrainian army and Russian army are more comparatively modern ones with a lot of heavy equipment, with airplanes, rockets, um, multiple rocket launchers, sophisticated, a lot of sophisticated equipment on both sides. Uh, Ukraine also inherited huge, huge military arsenal from the Soviet Union. Whatever was stationed on territory of Ukraine in 91 remained there. Except for, the, yeah, and there is another expert in nuclear arms, nuclear bombs, because Soviet Union was number one uh, in terms of nuclear arsenal. And when it broke up in 91, four countries uh, at the territory of four newly new countries like Russia, Ukraine, Belarus, and Kazakhstan, Uh, There were military bases with nuclear warheads, with nuclear rockets. And at that moment, Ukraine had the second largest nuclear arsenal uh, in the world. But Ukraine gave up. I mean, the Ukraine said that it would it would not be a nuclear power. And uh, there was pressure both from Russia and from this and from the United States back then in early 90s, so that Ukraine would give up nuclear arms. So there was this called Budapest Memorandum Agreement, where Ukraine was give, was transferring these nuclear warheads to Russia, and Russia, the US, the UK, and France signed this memorandum, which said that they would assure and guarantee security, independence of Ukraine and its territorial integrity and security, which, as you see, was broken by Russia several times. And uh, one would ask why the US, also a nuclear power, the UK and France would not defend Ukraine. And Ukraine calls on them and says, you signed on that agreement, you guaranteed uh, our uh, territorial integrity and uh, so sovereignty. But basically what they are saying, they are saying, guys, we are not going to into war with Russia because Russia is a nuclear state. So if we go into that war, then nuclear World War III will start and it will be a nuclear war. Uh, they no, support... No, no. I have a question. You said you talk about like the hidden narrative and the public narrative of Putin. Can you explain a bit about that also? Yeah, yeah. So there, I talked about open narrative, which is uh, that he wants to recreate Great, great Russia. And uh, he, he says, you, you, you can read his open letters and addresses. What he states aggressively that uh, Ukrainians, you, there is no, there is no such country as Ukraine. There is no such nation as Ukrainians. That Ukrainians are just Russians. That, but those Ukrainians uh, are like uh, that. 
Western Western countries, the US and the EU, just uh, not forced, but bought Ukrainians so that Ukrainians became anti-Russian uh, and so on, and that Ukraine is against Russia and so on. All this rhetoric, yeah. But the several important points: one, that Ukrainians are not a nation; they are not they are not different from Russians. They are the same people. That's what he tells to Russians. That's how he explains that, you know, there is no Ukraine and there are no Ukrainians. We are just one one world and we are one people so that we should be together. And so that's, you know, like, and they, this, what they call special operation, though it's a full scale war. They, uh, they, they, say, they say that they want to pacify, demilitarize and denazify Ukraine. He pushes a narrative that it is particularly it's surely it's only for domestic consumption because everyone doesn't take it seriously that Ukrainians are Nazis, you know, something like that. Uh, you have to understand probably background, the World War II, the 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 this war against Nazi Germany, that the word Nazi is used like very bad term and so on. If you want to dehumanize someone. You know, you call you call them Nazis or whatever. So that's kind of narrative. But then back to hidden narrative. Uh, I think that he is acting out of fear. Uh, what kind of fear? Uh, he is an autocrat. He is uh, like, in terms of political freedom and civil freedom, Ukraine, uh, Russia is similar now, uh, not even to China, but probably to North Korea. Yeah, uh, there is no opposition. Opposition is uh, was demolished 15 years ago. If you want to protest, you are beaten and put into the street. If you try to be a leader of opposition like Navalny, you can be poisoned by uh, Novichok or something like that. Uh, the only challenge to his power and power of his and his cronies' power is the street. He is very much afraid that there could be a popular uprising like during the elections, everyone knows that there are no free elections. So he saw that in other countries, and particularly in Ukraine, when the uh, the incumbent president tried to rig the elections, to steal the elections, people would not allow to do this. People would go into the street, protest, and even would force him out. So he is very afraid that that could happen in Russia. That's the only threat to his power. He is not. Uh, he's not afraid of to not being re-elected. If he makes the election results. So, Mario, Mario, well, wait, I'm sorry. Mario has a question yeah, about yeah, NATO and the European Union. But before, I wanted to ask you about the psychology of Putin because the other day you you named you told me about the psychology of Putin that he doesn't want to lose. Yeah. So he he uh, why Ukraine? Why he cares for Ukraine? He says that Ukrainians and Russians are the same. Yeah. But Ukraine and Russia are going two different courses. Russia is on a uh, despotic course and Ukraine is on freedom course. And Ukraine proved several times that it can, uh, it can fight despots. It can, it can you know, force despo despotic to be rulers to go away, either re-elected or forced to go away. You know? And in our country, every election is won by a new president. You know, unlike in Russia, where two, two, five times is the same, the same person is in power. So he thought, he thinks that if Ukraine is successful, and Ukraine it was showing a lot of success during the last uh, eight years after this uh, so-called, after 2014, in terms of economic development, in terms of social development, in terms of freedoms. So people in Russia would look up to Ukraine and say, why do we need to suffer this despotic regime if economically we are not better off. Ukraine is prospering uh, faster than we are and they are a democracy. Why don't we go to the streets and throw out Putin after the next election, if he rigs the election? So in his mind, Ukraine is an example of what can be done. And that's a threat to him. So he wants to Ukraine to fail or be demolished in whatever way. So that Russian people would not take it as an example. So that's, it's not just my reading, it's a reading of uh, uh, experts that 
you know, follow deeply what going, what's going on in Russia, what the developments are, and so on. Now back to the war. The plan was that uh, the whole campaign to take over the whole country would take not more than two weeks. And the plan was to immediately take over the capital, Kiev. Kiev is not far from uh, Belarusian border, just if you look at the map. So it's not in the center of the country. The country is actually very big. It's the largest uh, country in Europe by territory. But uh, the capital is 80 kilometers from uh, Belarusian border. So they, 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 this, this strike was immediately on Kiev, moving the troops and trying to encircle Kiev within two days. There was a plan to approach Kiev within one day and uh, during the second or third day to take over central government quarters and either to eliminate political leadership or force it to flee uh, to somewhere and uh, declare some and then the plan was to declare some puppet regime to install some puppet regime yeah there are many miscalculations in this plan from one of them is military miscalculation that didn't happen they were they, for two weeks they cannot take over kiev the ukrainian army though outnumbered in terms of equipment but has higher morale because it's fighting on its home soil fighting aggressor and fighting for life and freedom of their of their closed ones and uh, loved ones uh, this is and it was it took lessons from 2014 it is much more better equipped and prepared and trained than before than before 2014 before 2014 ukrainians would never imagine that they would have to go into a war but after 2014 lessons, uh, the army was improved drastically. So uh, the, the Putin's plan is off course in terms of military plan, in, 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 term, in terms of uh, following the military plan. And another one, he, he, he this sometimes propaganda, when you use propaganda, you repeat it so many times so that you start to believe it yourself. And that's what happened to Putin and his leadership. They, so much, they spend so much time on promoting the narrative that Russians and Ukrainians are the same people, that they are brothers, that they love each other, and that it's only some uh, Nazi junta sitting in Kiev that is forcing Ukrainians against Russians, and Ukrainians are waiting to be liberated by Russians. So the narrative was that we just enter Ukraine, Ukrainian army surrenders, and people will, will, greet, us, will greet us, I mean Russians, with flowers, you know, and uh, treat them as liberators. But it's not the case. It's vice versa. I mean, uh, people are supporting Ukraine. They feel they are Ukrainians and Russia is the aggressor that is bombing uh, Ukrainian peaceful cities and killing children, ordinary citizens, and so on. Uh, so. There, there are no, no one who would meet Russians with uh, roses and uh, flowers. Even, uh, they, even in one day out of 25 regional centers, they were able to take on, over only one uh, in southern Ukraine. And there, they were not greeted well by the population. They are there for three days and every day people with Ukrainian flags in numbers of tens of thousands come on, come to the central square where Russian troops are stated <laughs> and they are fighting <laughs> and they are not fighting physically. I mean, these are peaceful people. These are civilians, but they come to the streets with these flags and they chant uh, uh, for Ukraine and they chant for Russians to leave the city and calling them occupiers. This is unbelievable. Because it's not like a civil time. It's not like it's a, you can go into the street and protest, peaceful protest. You are facing military, Russian military. They are there with guns, with the fully equipped and so on. So, but this is just demonstrates that, uh, that Putin was wrong, that he is not a liberator. He is an aggressor that tries to occupy a uh, another country and other people which are not, you know, we are not going to take easy on him. Okay, so uh, Pablo, you live in Moscow and Western no. economic. Oh, I I used to work for some time, but uh, not yeah. 
Okay, so you have been in, in Russia and you know more about the situation there. So um, Western economic sanctions have hit the Russian economy and those will evidently affect the Russian citizens, right? So how is the political environment in Russia? Uh, what's the Russian citizenship general perceptions towards the war? And how could sanctions affect it? Um, and also, could the Western sanctions affect the West, specifically regarding the lack of energy sovereignty of certain European countries? And how could it be? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, this is a good one, actually. Uh, Putin was preparing for this war, and not just in military way. Uh, he was preparing for it in terms of uh, amassing financial resources and preparing economically. Uh, his first aggression, actually, was in 2008, and it was against Georgia. Uh, you know about this story. The, so R Russian forces occupied Abkhazia and South Ossetia, two regions of Georgia, and uh, basically, but they did not annex them. They uh, said these are independent countries. And, but they also moved on the capital of Georgia then. So what happened afterwards? There were no sanctions on Russia. If you look at that, yes, EU Sarkozy, French president at that time, took an active role. He mediated peace talks, and that was stopped. And, uh, and it, everyone got to business as usual after that. I mean, between uh, Western world and Russian. Uh, then there was Obama as president of the US, and Obama even tried to relaunch the relationships between the US and uh, Russia. Like, let's start from this. They said, let's turn the page, uh, forget about some differences. Let's start from the beginning, from the uh, blank page. Uh, so Putin noted on that, wow, no sanctions. I, I, do, I did what I wanted. And no sanctions. So in 2014, when he annexed uh, Crimea, uh, Western world woke up a little bit, but not on full scale. Yes, there were this invasion into Crimea started in late February 2014, and active part in Crimea was for a month, and Ukrainian army couldn't resist at that time because the country was politically in turmoil, change of leadership and so on. It's a complex story. Uh, but then when they tried to do the same thing in Donbass, there, is, uh, there was a newly elected president at that time and uh, the government institutions started to work, military started to work and that was at cost repelled and but parts of Donbass were occupied. And truly, truly speaking, if not for the incident in which Russians shot down MH17, Malaysian, uh, uh, Malaysian plane over those occupied territories, and when more than 200 people, from mostly actually Dutch, died in that in that shoot shoot at the plane. Before that, you know, Western countries were concerned. They installed some personal sanctions on some like 5, 10, 20 individuals that were involved in the legal annexation, but not much. Only after their citizens died on their plane, after Dutch citizens died on that plane, they started to, to, to tighten some stronger sanctions. But still, you know, just in my opinion, not very serious ones, not serious ones to stop Russia. Putin saw that, and uh, he, he saw that, okay, I can bear that. Those sanctions are of a kind that I can, you know, if I'm allowed to take over territories and to reconstruct the Soviet Union or, or Russian Empire, I'm ready to pay that price. So I think that the reaction was not adequate enough. Uh, Ukraine also asked for weapons, you know, for modern weapons, because it's, uh, Ukraine said, there is an aggressor. We are defending ourselves to defend effectively. We need some modern weapons, anti-tank, anti anti-aircraft weapons. And uh, NATO and uh, the US leadership were reluctant to provide uh, effective equipment, something like anti-tank anti uh, por portable uh, rockets like javelins or anti-aircraft stingers and so on. They were not supplying that those ones. 
they started to supply some in limited quantities only in 2018. So Russia adjusted to sanctions regime, uh, to whatever sanctions were provided, which were very weak ones. They adjusted for, to that. And then preparing for this full-scale invasion, Putin amassed uh, reserves, central bank reserves of three, uh, $640 billion. Yeah. And he thought when he was making the decision, it was in his speech. Yeah, yeah, we know there will be sanctions. But yeah, yeah, there were sanctions in 2014. Yeah, yeah, we are ready for that. He was on TV, airing on TV, asking the, the prime minister and minister of economy, are we ready for the sanctions? And then the head of the central bank, are we prepared? Uh, will we deal with that? And they were saying, yeah, yeah, fine. We are prepared. We shall deal with that. But I have to, yeah, but I have to admit that this time, uh, these sanctions are not nominal. They are actually real ones. Uh, except for oil and gas, for which one should talk separately. But as you know, uh, banking system is sanctioned almost fully. Like 75% uh, of banking system, state banks, they are under sanctions. They are cut off from SWIFT, international business, and so on. Even there are some sanctions which are provided not by the governments, but by businesses. Uh, many, many Western businesses, they are just exiting Russia. And some business businesses like uh, Visa or MasterCard, they said, full stop, we are exiting Russia. We will not service MasterCard uh, and uh, Visa uh, banking cards issued by Russian, Russian banks. Uh, many companies just close their offices and leave Russia. Uh, there, are, there are embargoes on uh, exporting to Russia technology, technologically sensitive goods and equipment like airplanes, cars, computers, even smartphones, telephones, and so on, so on. Pablo, can uh, you tell me how he changed it? Because you told me about the euros, how he changed everything from dollars to euros, why he did that. Yeah, uh, and there was, Putin was playing to this game you know, and that he's former KGB. This is like security, Soviet security, which was behind the repressive regime. Um, so their strategy is always divide and conquer. So he tried to divide uh, NATO countries and the EU countries, like providing some perks to Germany, which is the largest country in Europe in terms of economy. And uh, I, as far as I remember, even population. Uh, basically, Germany has a lot of influence in the EU. So he was, uh, he was, Putin was building additional pipelines, gas pipelines to Germany, uh, so that I would call it a bribe to Germany because it provides economic competitive advantage to Germany and try to establish exclusive relationship with Germany to separate Germany from uh, EU. Not, not, I mean, not formally, not legally, but so the Germans would be very loyal in, in terms of sanctions and uh, all negotiations and so on. Uh, so preparing for the sanctions, he understood that there would be sanctions. So most of the reserves, which were previously in US dollars, dollar assets in, in US dollar uh, accounts or some assets which were nominated in US dollars, they switched gradually to other currencies, mostly to EU and the Chinese yen. Uh, so like about 70-75% of the reserves are in, uh, in euros. And he bet that he would be able to carve out Germany uh, of the sanctions, that Germany would not support the sanctions. But uh, to his surprise, the EU and the uh, NATO and the US and some other countries like Canada and uh, Australia are very united in this, uh, in this standoff with Russia, in sanctions standoff. And uh, EU, US, Japan, uh, Canada and Australia implemented sanctions in terms that they have frozen any transactions with uh, Russian central bank assets. 
basically, yes, Russia has enormous reserves, but probably 80% of those reserves are not transactable. Russian Central Bank cannot make any transactions with those reserves. So that turned, made a turmoil in Russian financial system. People just are in panic. They don't know if their money will be stay in the bank, uh, what kind the Russian rubble devalued substantially. Uh, people cannot get money from the bank. They cannot do wire transfers and so on. Uh, there is a lot of panic there in terms of, of, of this impact on financial. It's not just financial. It's just, as I would say that you probably heard this term, that there was an iron curtain between the Soviet Union and the rest of the world. Yeah. So this iron curtain is is coming back again. And it's not just about financial transactions and economy, even physical movement. Uh, the airspace of EU is close to the Russian airlines. Uh, American Canadian airspace is also closed to, to Russian airlines. So I have a about President Zelensky, because we remember when when we had like the Trump Biden campaign, like there was this scandal between and like they say that Trump tried to bribe President Zelensky and he didn't allow him. So at the end, Biden won. And now we have these all these leadership coming from him. What's your opinion about President Zelensky? In his he, leadership? Uh, he, he was a big surprise in 2018 elections. He won the election against the incumbent president that was elected in 2014. And he is not from politics. He is uh, from show business. He he is what he's a comedian, actor, stand-up comedy, and movie comedies. He was very well known. All people knew him because his shows were on TV for like 10, 12 years. Uh, so, so there was this surprise move to go into politics. But I guess we live in this new era of in information age where. Um, Someone like Ronaldo can have what 400 million followers and uh, for or more, and if he tweets about something on or if he may support makes a post on Instagram, then I don't know what happens in the world. So, uh, so this this is Zelensky is the product of this new uh, social media and information age. Very surprising. I mean, politicians. Uh, Career politicians were very skeptical about him because he lacked uh, knowledge and experience. People thought that he is not prepared for, for this role. And uh, I admit I was among those skeptics also. Uh, I was not supportive of him back then in 2019. But uh, with regard to what happens now, he acts very, very courageously. He is very courageous. I mean... The Americans proposed to evacuate him immediately to abroad, and Americans said, "Your country will collapse in two days. Your army will surrender in two days." You know, that's what they were. That's what they thought would happen, and they said, "We know a lot. We have a lot of intelligence. We know what Russians are capable of. And though your army is good, but it's not as good as Russian, and so on." And Zelensky wouldn't wouldn't leave Kiev. He is defiant on that. He said, "We shall fight for. We shall. We are on our land. We shouldn't fly from. We shouldn't take flight from the capital. We should defend it, and we should fight, and we will be able to defend the country." So, but that's so. There is a complete change around perception of Zelensky. Surely, his popularity decreased since 2019 election. But with the start of the war, it's like 90, 92% support him now. But I guess that's natural because in, in, in the situation of war, uh, I mean, we ha people have to be united. The whole country should be united and supportive of each other against the aggressor. Yeah. But you, so far. Yes, one final question, Mario. Mario, go for the, for the question. And then we have to close because it's, uh, we only can allow to have one hour event. 45 sure, minutes. Sure. Oh, Mario. So, 
the last question is, uh, do you think that a diplomatic solution is possible for the country, uh, for this conflict? I know that Russia and Ukraine are talking and having negotiations. They have already agreed on um, a humanitarian corridor. So if so, if it's possible, uh, what do you think the solution could be? And what is the panorama for Ukraine in the short and in the middle term after the war? And what lessons could this conflict bring to future situation in, in Eastern Europe? Uh, first of all, it's not the problem of Eastern Europe. Uh, NATO woke up and they realized that they have an aggressor at their door, Putin. Uh, everyone thinks he is insane to start a war like this. With ca casualties of this war will be in. Uh, It's, it's already, they are already in tens of thousands of people, civilians and military, but they will be in hundreds of thousands. And it's 21st century in the middle of Europe when everyone thought it's impossible. So they are scared and they are united. NATO woke up. Everyone thought that NATO is dead. Is dead. Now they are, they are woke up. Yeah. So it's a completely different role. I mean, this is not just Ukraine and Eastern Europe or Europe. This, the uh, repercussions of this war will be all around the world, actually. But that will influence all the world. Uh, this is first thing. With regard to diplomatic solution, uh, I mean, we are, we are a peaceful nation and we would, no one wanted this war. And actually no one in Ukraine believed, for, believed into it, though it, the intelligence provided information that it's going to happen. But I my friends, people, all people that I know, everyone is in disbelief. Though it was in the news for half a year that Russia is amassing troops, but no one, you just, it's so terrible that you don't want to believe into this scenario, yeah? So diplomatic solution, Ukraine wanted diplomatic solution. I mean, there was, there was no war. Why would you go into war at all? You know, you, Ukraine is not a threat to Russia. It's not even capable to be a threat to Russia. So It all depends not on Ukraine, but it depends on Putin. Yeah. But if you look, if you hear his public comments, he says Ukraine has to admit that Crimea is part of Russia. Ukraine has admit that uh, Donbass, these occupied regions, are independent countries. And not just those occupied parts, but they claim that the whole Donbass. Donbass and Lugansk regions, because before February and even now, two thirds of these regions are not occupied. They are they were not occupied by separatists. Uh, so this is two. This is number two. Then Ukraine should never should never join NATO, and uh, so that should be and Ukrainian aspirations for NATO and the EU are in our constitution. So Ukraine should change the constitution. US and NATO should also confirm publicly, formally, that Ukraine will never be part of NATO. And then the last one, the, the last but not the least one, Ukraine should, uh, and here you, you I, I will ask you a question, how you will understand that demand. Ukraine should demilitarize de and Ukraine should be denazified. How do you read that? I mean, it's like, it's a demand for capitulation and not diplomatic, but military capitulation. It's a demand that lay down your arms, transfer your arms to, to us so that you will not be able to defend yourself. yourself. Yeah. And he already show, showed what he has done. And for now, we can defend ourselves. And uh, I believe that at the end of the day, we shall We shall repel this, yeah, whatever time it takes. Half a year, a year, three, five years, probably parts of the country will be occupied. Yeah, that also can be the case. But at the end of the day, you know, two, three, four, five years, uh, Russia behind the Iron Curtain, uh, blooding uh, financially, economically, with all these sanctions being pariah state, will collapse. I mean, Russian empire collapsed in the past. It collapsed in, in 19... 17, Soviet empire collapsed in 1989. It's the last geographical empire. Do you know that uh, Russia is a federation of 89 uh, small uh, uh, ethnic groups? 
89 ethnic groups, but they are all Russified. They don't. They speak just Russian. Very few people remember their language. Uh, I remember how Soviet Union and the Russian Empire was always called prison of nations. Uh, some of the classics used to call it prison of nations. So Russia doesn't provide us with diplomatic solution. What it says, uh, capitulate, give up your means of defense, and we shall then denazify you. Basically, what they use this term, but I very well understand what that means. That means ethnic cleansing. That means that whoever resists with arms will be killed. Whoever resists with peaceful protest will be beaten, jailed, imprisoned, and put into filtration camp or some re-education camp like in Shenzhen in China, something like that. And if you do not do, if you do not resist with arms, if you uh, do not resist with uh, peaceful means like pro peaceful protest, but you don't like it and you don't agree with this, then the, the best option for you is to emigrate, to leave the country. I don't know the other words for this to describe as only ethnic cleansing. Occupation and ethnic cleansing. Thank you very much for that, Lag. On that very sad note, we have to close because we're already over the time, but it's really sad like what you are telling us. But I think for our students, it's really like a, a good thing to get to know all the things that are happening in Ukraine from an Ukrainian perspective, because uh, what we get here in Ecuador is everything is filtered by the media in the international media. So we, we we are dreaming about a diplomatic solution, but when you are- We telling, also, we want also diplomatic solution. And I still, you know, I hope there will be one, but very sad, I, I, so far, I don't see it. I mean, unfortunately, there will be much, much more casualties, civilian and military before, I mean, there will be some kind of solution, unfortunately. No, thank you, Pablo, but, I know. But I also, Carlos, I also appreciate this opportunity to provide like information of you and background from Ukrainian perspective to to your students, to you, so that you have understanding. And I also hope for your support of Ukraine. Ukraine in this situation is defending itself. It's not an aggressor. And uh, Russia being a nuclear state and taking easily, trying to, to you know, just to, to overtake other free countries is a threat, not just Ukraine. After, after Ukraine, it can go to Georgia, Moldova, Baltic state. And if it's not resisted internationally, why not to return Poland, Finland, and so on? Yes. Okay, Pablo, thank you very much. I was really, thank really... Thank you. Thank you very thank much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Have a nice day. Bye-bye. Thank you. Stay safe. Keep safe. Bye-bye. Gracias, Mario. Gracias a todos de la comunidad universitaria de los hemisferios.